last time you remember that we had started with the brief outline of the structural engineering field and we have seen some basic aspects and brushed up what you have already studied in the college days uh, in today's lecture we shall be considering uh, these five six uh, points uh, one will be the review of lecture which we have seen last time then the theories on strength of materials which you have studied uh, way back in your college days uh, mechanics of solids and the assumptions in various theories which we have studied in the college days and uh, we will just uh, briefly brush through it the governing equations of strength of materials which we use for converting the forces into stresses and so on and basic formulae in strength of materials and uh, if time permits we will have a brief uh, stint with etabs and so on. in the lecture that we have seen last time we have seen various building blocks of the structures and we have seen how an engineer understands a structure so we have analyzed uh, or we have named various uh, structures or we have uh, got those structural you can say uh, identification wherein we have considered a truss once we say it is a truss then there are some characteristics associated with it that all joints are connected by a pin Uh, there are load supplied only at the joints so that primarily the internal forces will be only axial forces either tension or compression in different members and the displacements at different points for a plane truss will be only two in nature uh, two in number that is x and y so once we say it is a plane truss then we say that automatically few things are presumed that they are there in terms of the connections the loads the supports and so on and so forth the next thing we have is a beam which we have seen last time that for a beam there is some lateral load applied on it it is uh, simply supported or su suitably supported internal forces at any point when you consider the load applied on it there will be some shear force in the beam and some bending moment associated with it while at any point there will be some lateral displacement and there is going to be some rotation of the tangent at these various points so once i presume that the beam is loaded with some loads and so on then we immediately visualize that it will get deflected in this fashion and at any point then we will have a rotation of the tangent and a lateral displacement over here under the influence of uh, lateral load applied on the beam uh, as far as the next structure is concerned so we considered a plane arch so for a plane arch whatever the shape may be circular or parabolic and so on some load is applied on it and for an arch now we consider that at any point if you take a cut at this point and then see the internal forces there may be some axial force in the arch tension or compression there may be some shear force and there is some bending moment in arches due to the curvature most of the time uh, the forces are only axial but the axial force is uh, sometimes associated with the shear force depending upon the kind of load that we consider and some bending moment it is either a two hinge arch or a fixed arch or a hinge and roller type arch and so on depending upon the support condition that you provide then we have the cable type of structure i think you people in your company is doing lot of work on this uh, cable uh, stayed bridges and so on while this cable that we consider is like a cable used in suspension bridges so for a cable like this we have got at any point only the axial force present so no matter what load you are considering it is only the axial force that you will be having and that too also only tensor there will be no compressive force in the cable because of the uh, small cross section involved and because of its inability to resist the bending moment so there may be some displacement in whatever direction but the axial force will be only tensile in this case then we have the space truss type structure where three dimensional structures are considered where various loads are applied at joints and so on and so forth in whatever direction that you consider the load at any point in the member uh, over here for example you take either top member or bottom member whatever the member that you are considering it will be primarily subjected to either a tensile force or a compressive force so we will have only axial forces in the members of a truss where we again presume that the loads are applied at the joints and the members are connected to each other by means of ideal frictionless hinges 
so there is all freedom for rotation and on that assumption we consider that there will be only axial force in the member of a space truss the next uh, structure that we had considered was a plane frame wherein if some loads are applied some lateral load some vertical load whatever the uh, point of application and so on under the influence of all these loads for a plane frame for any member we will have some axial force we will have some shear force and there may be some bending moment at different points and so on and so forth okay so these are the kinds of forces that we expect so as soon as i say that i have got a plane frame then immediately i visualize that it will have members carrying only axial force shear force and bending moment and at any joint that you consider the displacement there may be horizontal displacement there may be vertical displacement and there may be some rotation over here so under the influence of all these loads the structure may get deformed in whatever form depending upon the type of load that you are applying and various kinds of displacements are expected at various points in the given structure but finally there will be only three displacements at each joint delta x delta y and the rotation at that point which is about an axis perpendicular to the plane of the structure which we say is assuming that the structure lies in xy plane then you have got the rotation about z axis which is perpendicular to the plane of the structure so there will be rotation about an axis which is uh, z axis in this particular case that is for plane frame if you consider a space frame a three dimensional structure over here no matter what loads you are applying in which direction maybe udl whatever the type of load that you are considering various types of loads may be considered for which now any point in the member that you consider for any member there will be axial force maybe tension or compression there may be shear force in one direction as you consider over here for example this member this can have a shear in this direction say x xz uh, if you consider the uh, axis system as x y as horizontal plane and z is vertical then for this particular member there may be shear in x direction in this way or there may be shear in y direction also because of the load that is applied in this case so you will have two shear forces in this member so it will be either in x direction which is perpendicular to the member but in the direction perpendicular to the member you will have either for this way or this way so accordingly we say that there will be two shear forces so if i consider member to lie in let us say uh, x direction then i will have the shear force in y direction i will have shear force in z direction if i consider member to lie in x direction perpendicular to that you will have two uh, shear forces and there will be for this uh, any member that you consider whatever the load and uh, deflection that is suffers at any point in the given member there will be three kinds of moments so if i show over here for this member there will be bending in one plane it might bend in this direction it might bend in the direction perpendicular to that in this direction and it will undergo a torsional uh, rotation also so there will be three types of moment if i consider member to lie along x direction then there will be moment about y axis or moment about z axis and there will be a torsion which is about its longitudinal axis which is now as we say it is mx or many times it is designated as the torsional moment which is about x axis so we say that for any member of a space truss there will be three uh, moments one is the torsional moment and other two are the normal moments which is either about y axis or z axis at any joint in addition to that there will be three linear displacements like delta x delta y and delta z so i will have this delta z and this delta y so three linear displacements will be there under the influence of general load and there will be three rotations so rotation about x axis rotation about y axis and rotation about z axis all the three rotations will also be there. so as soon as you classify a structure as space frame and visualize certain general loading on it then you can immediately come to a conclusion at that at each joint there will be six displacements in terms of linear displacement delta x delta y and delta z and there will be 
three rotational displacements like theta x, theta y, and theta z. Okay. In addition to that, now there are forces. So I have got axial force. I have got shear force in y direction, shear force in z direction, like that. And the three moments that we have considered as m x, m y, and m z. Out of that, m x is the torsional moment, which is about its longitudinal axis. Why we consider these three types of moments are that the design for these types of forces is quite different. The way you design a member for torsional moment is different than the way you design it for normal bending moment. The normal moment bending moment gives rise to different types of stresses, while torsional moment gives rise to another kind of stresses. The result of that is you have to classify them in that fashion. Like you are, there is some force on the member. But we still say there are axial forces and there are shear forces because the way they develop the stresses are different. Many times the properties of the material is also different to resist shear or to resist axial force. That too also for tension, some materials have got different property. Compression has got another property, and so on and so forth. That is why we want to classify the forces in this general fashion so that. at the design stage we will have a proper uh, classification of the stresses for uh, proper designing over there then we have got the plane grid system where the entire structure is in one plane like the previous uh, uh, plane frame that we have considered plane frame is also a structure which is in one plane plane grid is also a structure which is in one plane but there is a difference that for plane frame the load is in the same plane so i have got the load in the same plane may be horizontal or vertical i am not visualizing this kind of out of plane forces over there it will be only in plane forces for a plane frame while in case of grid now we see that we have got a grid like a flow grid system the whole structure is in one plane but the load is applied perpendicularly it is different than our plane frame for plane frame the load is in the same plane while here it is perpendicular to the the result of that is for this grid there may be bending if i see it from the sides then i will be able to see that these beams are bending in this fashion for the other beams they are bending in this particular fashion and so on so we say that at any point if you consider there is going to be some lateral displacement if i consider the plane grid to lie in for example xy plane and z is perpendicular to, uh, sorry this is y direction this is y then i will say that there is going to be some displacement in z direction out of plane and there will be rotation for this beam which is either about uh, this axis is y axis so i am getting the rotation about y axis and for the other beam it is rotation about x axis so i have got one linear displacement and two rotational displacement theta y and theta z while earlier for plane frame we have seen that we have got two linear displacements and one rotational displacement so that is the major difference in the behavior of plane frame and plane grid as far as moments are concerned we will say that there will be for this beam some bending moment for the other beam also there will be bending moment so i will have moment either about x axis or moment about y axis okay these are going to be the moments and there will be the torsional moment because of the connectivity issue so at any particular point there will be torsional moment so i will say that for any member if i consider to member to lie in x direction and perpendicular to that is z then i will have moment about z axis over here and there is going to be a torsional moment so for this particular beam if i consider this long beam then it is going to bend in this fashion that that is shown over here but because of its bending in this direction the beam perpendicular to that is getting subjected to torsional moment because they are connected in this particular case so at this common point if i consider this beam to have a bending moment a beam perpendicular to that will have torsional moment due to that action and for this beam where there is bending moment the other beam will be subjected to torsion so we will say that for any beam there is going to be some bending moment some torsion eh, and because of the lateral load that we are considering there is also going to be the shear force in z direction so we have three forces out of that two are the bending forces that is bending moment mx and torsion and one is the shear force over here. we don't expect any axial force in the members of plane grid over here okay 
now then we have got the floor slab uh, with which you are all well versed because you are uh, designing this floor slab for crystals concrete and so on for floor slab again on the same lines like plain grid it is similar to plain grid except that there are no beams there is only a two dimensional medium with thin uh, slabs provided for which then we say that there is again going to be some bending moment in the uh, in the slab in one direction or the other direction that you consider and there will be shear force and so on so for the beam uh, for the uh, slab you have got moment in x direction moment in y direction if you visualize that the slab to lie in xy plane and there is also the shear force in addition to that because of the interaction there will be uh, torsional moment so we have some torsional moment t also so these two moments are your pure bending either in this direction or in the other direction but there is interaction which gives rise to torsional moment so in general we say that for a element of a slab there is going to be some moment there is going to be some torsional moment and there is going to be some shear force okay so these three forces are automatically associated with an element of a slab and we have three linear or uh, three displacements out of that one is rotation about x axis other is rotation about y axis and the third one is the linear displacement out of plane okay so as soon as you consider slab or visualize it then immediately you can associate these characteristics in terms of displacements and in terms of the internal forces over here okay then we have got another type of structure which is a shell structure which is uh, qu quite often used when architect prefers uh, different types of shapes for structures and so on for the elements of a shell structure therefore uh, the behavior is different than slab it has got some in plane forces either in this direction or in the other direction so the in plane forces are there either tension or compression in addition to that there are shear forces in in the plane itself in this direction so there are shear forces in this direction and in addition to that there are forces which are normal to this particular plane so out of plane shears are also present in the other direction and so on. so in general for an element of a shell there are membrane forces which are take, uh, generally denoted as nx ny and nxy the in plane forces in plane axial force in plane in x and y direction and there is in plane shear then we have the bending moment mx my and mxy like an element of a uh, slab uh, in uh, moment in both directions and the torsional moment and there is the out of plane shear qx qy and so on. so we see that all types of forces are present in an element of a shell while for slabs you have only these moments and uh, rotations are associated with that and so on while shear forces are present but all forces are present in an element of a shell where there will be we say there will be in general delta x delta y and delta z the three linear displacements at any point and there will be also the rotations theta x theta y and theta z on the rotations so in general for a shell we will say that all types of forces are present and all types of linear and rotational displacements are also present sometimes you come across folded plates which i have indicated to you last time these folded plates are supported on to opposite uh, diaphragms so many time diaphragms are provided on this face and on the other face so for a uh, folded plate like this this is the span from this end to this end now that's the span of the folded plate and it is supported over here and here on the uh, uh, by providing the diaphragms over here. so these are very long span structures preferred for its architectural uh, beauty and also uh, when you have to cover very large uh, distances if you provide flat surfaces then they become very heavy so many times it is preferred for such situation its behavior is similar to shale except that for shale it is a continuously curved surface while here it is a kind of uh, flat surfaces connected in different fashion but they develop similar forces like the shale so you have got in plane shear axial and so on the bending moments and the shear forces all these forces are also present in folded plates and so on. 
uh, now we have got this three dimensional solid where we sometime provide such kinds of solids blocks for machine foundations uh, for supporting the huge forces coming from large generators or compressors and so on so these uh, blocks are supported only on uh, you can say soil surrounding it uh, on all sides and uh, subjected to whatever the loads applied may be static load or uh, forces coming from the uh, uh, vibration of the machines and so on so all kinds of dynamic static loads are applied and uh, this three dimensional solid thereby uh, develops all internal forces the stresses sigma x sigma y and tau xy the shear stresses in plane forces then we have the uh, uh, the uh, bending moments sometimes develop mx my and mxy all kinds of forces are developed but generally for three dimensional solids the in plane forces are oh sorry the internal stresses are only calculated as sigma x sigma y and sigma z then you have got uh, the shear forces in all planes tau xy tau yz and tau zx so if you take a small element of this solid block for example so you have this small element over here okay so here you will have the normal stresses on each of the face over here the top and bottom face the side faces and so on. so all types of internal forces are developed over here sigma x sigma y sigma z and on each of the plane you have got either shear this way or shear that way okay so two shears are present over here and so on. so for more complex structure like this you may have to consider the analysis in uh, uh, exact fashion then you have got plane stress problem which i had indicated to you last time that plane stress problem is a type of structure which is very thin in one direction and has got reasonable dimension in remaining two like you have got a beam for example for this beam the span is reasonably large the depth is sufficiently large but the width is very small many time you can take it as unit width only and accordingly whatever the loads applied we don't bother to see what happens in the third dimension that is in width we are only interested in calculating the forces in the plane itself in this vertical plane so in this plane you have got either sigma x or sigma y that is in plane forces are there and there is also the shear force that is tau xy so for a, a simple beam it is generally taken as a plane stress problem where we don't bother to see what happens in the width direction we presume that it is same in all the, all the uh, points in the width but as far as depth is concerned there is variation in top you might have compression bottom you will have tension and so on and so forth so you will have different types of stresses at different points depth wise and length wise but in the thickness direction we don't say that there is variation it is the same in entire thickness and so on. so this is a kind of problem which is of course uh, you are well versed with it as a beam so for a beam uh, it is uh, you can say as a plane stress problem then you have got plane strain problem which i had indicated to you last time that like your retaining wall or tunnel and so on where there are very long structures in one direction the length is very large but you take a slice of that and analyze only that slice and then uh, visualize that for the full length the same uh, stress distribution uh, is applicable in that case we say that it is different than our plane stress problem where for plane stress problem we say that the thickness is very small while here the thickness is very large but we take a slice and then treat it as a plane strain problem but then say that there is one interconnectivity between elements along the length so we have these uh, normal stresses like what we have considered for plane stress problem sigma x sigma y and tau xy and there is one more stress which is present in the length direction and that is sigma z so there is one more stress present as far as the plane strain problem is concerned because there is connectivity for the full length so some stresses are developed due to poisson's effect and those uh, are also required to be determined and so on. then we have what sometimes the axis symmetric shell where they are symmetric about one axis about which you can visualize the geometry is developed by rotating a plane curve about that axis and then you are considering the stress distribution in such cases where we presume that for all points in a given cross section 
the stresses are same there may be some internal pressure or there may be some uh, self weight and so on applied in such cases for a given slice we presume that the stresses are calculated and then they are transferred from uh, top to bottom and so on. so axisymmetric shell is another type of shell that we consider over here now that is all that what we have considered last time that we have considered various types of structure structural elements the internal forces why i had to repeat this again because as soon as you are handling powerful tools like e tabs or adapt and so on they are very powerful tools which are able to analyze any type of structure as soon as you analyze the structure then you get various types of stresses so if you as an engineer understand its behavior then you know which stresses are going to be of importance in this type of structure though the software can give you all stresses you know that as a engineer that some stresses are predominant in this type of structure as a result you will concentrate only on those important structure uh, internal forces those displacements uh, which are of importance for that type of structure and so on now when we say that our objective is to uh, treat the whole structure and to do its complete analysis design and so on then we see that we have uh, dealing with the basic operations of a structural uh, that a structural engineer does and that is one is analysis of the structure depending upon the type of structure you have got and the software that you are using okay you will carry out analysis of the structure which will involve determining internal forces in the members of the structure so as a engineer at a lower level you will say that okay someone decides uh, some important parameters that uh, the structure will be of this type of this material and so on and so forth and then you are able to finally idealize that structure as a mathematical model analyze it by properly using the software and determine internal forces in the members of the structure the next task is to design the structure so there lies another field you can say where depending upon the material that you have got it may be steel or concrete and so on accordingly you will have to use an appropriate methodology for designing that structure over there because internal forces whether it is steel or concrete will be same thing uh, same in the sense there may be axial force shear force bending and so on. but the way you design a steel structure is different than the way you design a concrete structure the procedure is different the basic concepts are different the material properties are different in steel structure it is the homogeneous material only one material and you have to deal with that one material directly uh, depending upon the internal stresses developed and so on while in case of concrete you have two materials the steel and concrete so you have to see whether concrete stresses are within limit or steel stresses are within limit and then you say that your design is complete in case of steel that is not the case it is only one material so you have to directly check whether it has got uh, reasonable stresses and so on and the third stage will be preparation of drawings because whatever you design you carry out finally it must be implemented somewhere the people at site or in the workshop they must understand what you are designing different sections how they are uh, connected to each other so all those details are what a engineer finally visualizes and gives it for uh, execution at site and so on so we say that as far as the analysis of simple structure is concerned our objective is to determine the internal forces which are the characteristics of the structure which we have seen for beam i will be concentrating on shear force and bending moment for column it will be mainly axial uh, force or if it is a general column then we will say there will be all types of forces and so on and so forth so we say that for different types of structures there will be after analysis or the way you are the analysis there will be internal forces develop and once you say that internal forces are developed depending upon the kind of structure that you have got then we say that uh, various forces are developed from your analysis operation that you have determined axial force you have determined shear force bending moment torsional moment everything is determined now your objective is to check or design the given member for design purpose you have already got a member you have taken some sizes in your analysis software and determine the forces now you want to see whether those sizes are adequate or in case of steel structure or concrete once you determine all the internal forces the next task is as far as steel structure is concerned you have to check as to what is the stress developed in the material 
and whether that is less than the permissible stress so by knowing only the force your design is not complete you need to know the stresses and those stresses are have got, they have got the limiting values so for a force i cannot say whether 100 ton or 200 ton is the limiting value if i know the stress 100 mpa or 200 mpa then i can say yes whether that can be carried by that material because for material i know its permissible stress or i know its yield stress the ultimate stress and so on. they are all known as characteristics of the material i have got a structure of some specific material so i need to convert these forces from forces to stresses and for that purpose we need to consider the basic design philosophy that i have got a member carrying some axial force so i want to calculate the stress actual stress and see whether it is less than ultimate stress or whether it is less than permissible stress depending upon the methodology i had of i can use uh, the working stress method or the limit state method and so on depending upon that we say that there are actual stresses calculated there are permissible or ultimate stresses or the uh, ultimate stress upon factor of safety that you decide to use that will give you permissible stress or sometimes for material like tor steel and so on you either use proof stress as a limiting stress and then use a factor of safety or for mild steel you have got yield stress for yield stress you adopt some factor of safety and say that okay that is my permissible stress for that particular material so we say that there is one criteria that we use for design purpose and that is the stress should not exceed permissible value but that is not the only method of failure uh, the mode of failure for a structure the failure can arise due to various causes and as an engineer i want to avoid all types of failures i cannot say that okay if i stress uh, if stress is limited that is all that i must see no there are other kinds of failure which you must explore and see whether that kind of failure is possible and if so then you have to provide adequate margin of safety against that so we say that one criteria that we select first and foremost is the failure due to over stressing must be avoided so firstly we calculate the stress check whether it is less than permissible stress okay so failure against over stressing is considered next is failure due to buckling sometimes under compressive load depending upon its length of the member the buckling uh, load is to be calculated in addition to your normal design over here you have to check whether that particular member can buckle because if it fails by buckling while otherwise under compression you might see that okay the stress is quite small but this kind of failure might be uh, more critical and then you have to again guard against that the third type of failure that we consider which is very true in case of concrete structure is the creep type this creep is the sustained loading that a structure carries develops uh, additional deformations and that additional deformation can sometimes lead to visual deformation that are seen and then you will have to guard against such kind of failure because today instantaneously as you apply a load there is some deformation but over a period of time for concrete there is minute level movement of the molecules at a very small level and that continuously gives rise to additional deformation so we have to see that under creep also the structure is not uh, developing excessive deformation then we must see that failure due to shrinkage in case of concrete that becomes very important because if initially lot of shrinkage occurs some cracks might develop in concrete and that can lead to uh, weakness at the initial stage itself you must have seen in many of the slabs sometimes if curing is not properly done then there are initial uh, level cracks and that can lead to uh, serious consequences or then failure due to fatigue when you are dealing with machine foundations or such structures where harmonic forces those generated due to operation of machines if they are developed uh, they are applied then that force may be very small but it is continuously varying in the sense sometimes it is up sometimes it is down left right or in case of bridges continuously there is a movement of loads so there is sometimes some additional stresses are developed and then there is no stress at all and so on so if such kind of continuous variation in stresses is there then that many times lead to fatigue type of failure that the stress level is low but 
still because of the continuous variation the molecules sometimes move apart then move closer and that happens continuously and if that is done several times then it can lead to failure the simple example is when you want to break a wire what you do is you take a wire bend it, it doesn't happen it just takes that shape but if you do it four five times then it breaks into uh, pieces because that uh, fatigue failure it cannot take continuous reversal of the stresses if they are applied then such kind of structure uh, can fail due to fatigue initially the stresses might be small but if you do it four five times or continuously then after some time you will see that the whole thing fails the stresses may be low but because of the continuous reversal the failure might arise then sometimes as we see that if the soil foundation is weak then there is some settlement of support and that can give rise to very serious internal forces so we have to many times worry about the kind of strata the foundation that is available so we have to see whether under the influence of the loads whether it will give rise to uh, failure due to settlement now settlements are of two types one is uniform settlement of all the foundations and other is non uniform settlement some might settle by 50 mm some might settle by 20 mm like so if it is uniform settlement then there is no problem at all your building which is 50 meter in height might become later on 49 meter above ground and 1 meter below ground okay you will see that okay still my building is intact nothing happened but if one column settles more than the other then there is serious problem many times in case of grouping of column foundations this situation arises that you group various columns and then you say that okay for some column though actual footing required is less i am providing more thinking that it is safe it is safe as far as that individual footing is concerned but when you consider 10 such footings then for one footing the pressure might be 10 ton per square meter for some other footing it may be 30 ton per square meter permissible is 30 so you are happy that everything is less than 30 but the one which has got 30 ton per square meter will settle as per 30 ton pressure this one will settle as per 10 ton per meter square the result of that is one will settle less other will settle more and if they settle unequally then there is a problem because the beam will be subjected to additional moments and then the thing becomes serious so we have to see that the uh, unequal settlement between different supports is also taken care of by providing everywhere large foundations is not a guarantee against failure because it can give rise to differential settlement and then sometime it can uh, give rise to serious consequences sometime due to unforeseen or accidental situation uh, some failure arises that is of course most of the time it is site engineers uh, prerogative that you should see that during the entire operation of assembly erection and so on the unforeseen uh, situation doesn't arise or properly taken care of and failure due to excessive deformation so uh, one is the over stressing and other is the deflection sometime your structure might be safe against stress but it might deflect excessively as an engineer you are fully confident that stresses are within limit but if the deflection is visible then the user gets a fear in his mind that oh structure is already deformed so how can i use it like that or sometimes these these kinds of situation give rise to uh, some functional problem for example if you have got a lift shaft and uh, the lift shaft undergoes some deformation then many times the lift mechanism gets affected because it needs exact vertical alignment and if that is not present uh, due to deformations and so on then it can give rise to functional problem and that is uh, again a headache you have to tackle as an engineer okay now for any material when we say that we need to consider the uh, permissible stresses and so on so we have got normal behavior for material which is indicated in terms of stress strain curve so you have seen in your college days that you can carry out this simple experiment measure the deformations or the elongation and carefully plot a graph of stress versus strain and accordingly you will see that for concrete so this is the typical stress strain curve that is indicated so it is more or less linear or very small deviation from linear in the initial part of the curve later on it flattens out reaches a peak and then of course later on uh, the failure is imminent and so on so many time we consider the maximum strain in concrete limited to 
0.002 the maximum stress over here and consider the linear range in the initial part and so on now this is as far as concrete is concerned for steel the behavior is uh, different it is almost straight in the initial part and then it deviates from that for mild steel at about 250 uh, mpa uh, it almost flattens out in this particular case for a long uh, range it has got uh, no change in stress but the only elongation takes place so it is almost a flat portion for a considerable amount of strain and so on and so forth. while for harder steel like uh, tor steel or uh, high strength uh, uh, strands that you consider in pristis concrete uh, the same curve continues for quite some time uh, for reasonably high value of stress and then it flattens out so for those steels like tor steel where high carbon steels are uh, considered the uh, yield stress is almost uh, absent as you get in mild steel for mild steel uh, the yield stress is predominant so limiting value is taken over here while for tor steel it deviates from straight segment so what is done is at any point if you try to unload the element then it take goes back to its initial position but when it comes to initial position there is some permanent deformation already occurring in that particular material so if you consider this particular material when it elongates and at some time you start unloading and when you come back over here at this point uh, you consider that over here there is some permanent deformation and that permanent deformation okay the power is button karat tak maine light lagle na power sa ha acha light aali pan ka fluctuate kare the hr inverter inverter चाय गरम करके लिख when we say it is 0.2% proof stress it means that you unload at some stress level and the permanent deformation that you get is 0.2% so this stress at which you unload it is the 0.2% proof stress so for our fe415 red steel this 415 stress at which you unload it and come back then you will see that there is a permanent deformation of point uh, 0.2% or 0.002 so when we say it is 0.2% strain it means that at that stress 415 uh, on unloading it will show a permanent strain of 0.2% or 0.002 for mild steel generally if you see the exact stress strain curve then it has linearly elastic up to some point then it drops down this point is called as the upper yield point is the lower yield point then it flattens out at this particular level the strain that you get is about 0.1% while at this point where the strain hardening occurs and it again start developing resistance here it is about 1% strain so from this point to this point it is almost 10 times larger here it is only 0.1% while here it is 1% and later on uh, it elongates uh, develops additional resistance and finally the failure occurs at this point where the strain is 23% please remember it is very large uh, deformation for mild steel at failure it is 23% at this point while for elastic limit is only 0.1% so you can say that this strain at failure is 230 times larger please remember it is not 230% but it is 230 times larger than the strain that you get at elastic limit so it is a highly ductile material it will show very large deformation before it fails 
when it undergoes uh, this kind of deformations and so on. The uh, other steel which you use for uh, pre stressing strands, so there we see that the behavior is similar. Only thing is the same straight line continues for quite some time, and uh, that is why you can see that it is over 1800 grade or 1860 grade. So those strands are elastic up to a very high stress, but the E value, the ratio of stress to strain is same. It is 2 into 10 raised to uh, 5 MPa. So that remains same. For mild steel, it may be up to here. For torque steel, it may be up to here. But for high tension steel that you are using for strand, the same straight line continues for quite some time, and then it develops a very high stress before the uh, failure finally occurs. For uh, high strength uh, steel of uh, stressing cables, the percentage elongation is just 4 to 5 percent at failure. While for mild steel, it is about 23 percent, as uh, we have seen over here. Here it is 23 percent, and for torque steel that is about 14 to 15 percent. So we can see that the steel that you normally use for uh, pre-stressing purpose, there the elongation is 4 to 5 percent at failure. So it is not as ductile as mild steel, but still much better than concrete. For concrete, the strain is quite low; it is 0.2 percent, while there it is 4 to 5 percent, and so on. Okay. So now we say that internal forces developed in the member are to be calculated. So we have got tension or compression and once that stress is to be developed, then we say that firstly I need to consider the behavior of the member or behavior of the material. Uh, as far as your normal stress is concerned, it is tension or compression. So we say that there is an axial force P and there is a cross sectional area A. So I have got P upon A as simple as that, either direct compression or tension and that we presume that it is uniform for the entire section. In case of shear, the behavior is different. Uh, shear is developed due to three different causes. One is the direct shear, so here you can see perhaps if you remember the way uh, direct shear test is conducted in strength of material lab. Of course in strength of material lab in our college also it used to be a demonstration type test. So the whole class or maybe 50 percent of the class has one batch. So they assemble all around it and some are standing near the door just waiting to see <laughs> that as soon as the test is over they will go out. So this demonstration test is uh, what is done in strength of material uh, where it is a direct tension, direct shear test which is done. So you have got a small bar which is taken. It, there is a shear shackle, a small gadget through which it passes, it has got those fixed supports at the sides and this central portion is pushed down. So uh, it fails at these two locations over here and over here. So it is a direct shear test which is done for this small bar and there we will say that the shear stress is directly the force you are applying actually it is uh, not f upon a but it is two times a, sorry, it is f upon two way because failure occurs at two planes. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously it has to fail at two places and then uh, we determine that for this member the shear stress which is uniform throughout there we say that direct shear uh, is uh, f upon two way. So this shear stress distribution through the cross section is uniform if it is direct shear. If you consider the shear in beams where it is due to lateral load and there is some change in bending moment in the beam that gives rise to the sliding action for different layers of the beam. If there is sliding action uh, for different layers, for example, if you consider for example three strips which are placed one over the other and they are not connected to each other at interface, then what will happen is for this strip there is tension at top, compression at bottom. For the lower strip there is tension at top, there is compression at bottom and so on and so forth. So continuously for these three strips that you consider there is tension and compression there is similar behavior over here and so on. So at the interface what happens is when you are considering upper strip and the lower strip the upper strip at this phase as you see over here is in compression while the lower strip at that point 
the lower strip at that point now we see just the lower strip at that point now we see that it is in compression the result of that is you have got two strips over here so this strip is in compression this is in tension okay the result of that is there is sliding action between the two because each is bending independent of the other the result of that is each has got tension and compression through its depth so they will slide and then there is one behavior for this three independent you can say strips but if they are connected to each other then you are getting a common depth over here if they are connected to each other then there is a total depth for example if individual strip has got a thickness t then each one bends as if it has got a depth t and there are three beams each of the t while if they are connected then there is a single beam of depth 3t okay so there is single beam of 3t so there is a single beam of depth 3t and there is there are three beams or each of depth t okay so they are different the behavior is totally different this has got a moment of inertia if i take unit width and so on then it has got a moment of inertia 1 into t cube by 12 and there are three such beams so i have got three times t cube by 12 while if i have got single beam of 3t then it is 1 into 3t cube by 12 so that is 27t cube by 12 while here it is 3t cube by 12 so we see that this is 20 nine times stronger than the other one the moment of inertia is very large when they are connected because there is no sliding action this sliding is in fact a shearing action that we visualize when you take any beam over here now this arises because you are considering for this particular beam uh, there is uh, you can say that there is for this particular beam there is continuously change of bending moment so if i show for this beam a lateral load applied then we get a bending moment diagram which is like this is that correct it is having a maximum value p into l at the support and it has got zero value at the center and so so if i take a small element then i will try to show what are the forces developed in this element so i am taking this small element so this is the full depth of the beam 3t whatever that i am getting over here what is happening is at this face there is some uh, okay let me show tensile forces okay there are tensile stresses over here and here also i have got tensile stress now this tensile stress is due to moment at this point and this tensile stress is due to moment at this point those two moments are different the result of that is this tensile force is as we see is further away uh, near the uh, free end so this is slightly less while this is slightly more if i take this small element over here then we say that the equilibrium will be developed due to these shear stresses which is developed at the interface so if i take this upper element only then there is some tensile force at this end there is larger tensile force at this end and the balance is provided by the shear at this point so this is that horizontal shear that we see is developed at the interface through the depth so as you go towards the neutral axis there is more difference over here because the entire force on this face is taken care of the entire on this is taken care of so if you take only at the top only that much force is present while as you take uh, go lower and lower then there is more difference between the two sides and the result of that is you are able to get at this particular point the shear stress which i think i am sure you have calculated in your strength of material class that the shear stress that you get oh sorry okay let me show it first. the shear q is equal to s a y bar if you remember that upon i into b where b is that breadth at that particular section a y bar is that area that you are considering so this area i am taking uh, at the point where i am calculating the stress by neutral axis may be here so i am taking this distance the cg of this shaded area from the neutral axis as y bar and area of the shaded portion that is my a 
and i is the moment of inertia of the entire section and b is the width of that section so this is the way we generally uh, from equilibrium consideration we visualize how the stresses are changing so this stress that we get in beam is due to change in bending moment that you will have to understand it very carefully that uh, the shear force is the lateral force that you have applied but it is can develop at the interface in horizontal direction because there is change in bending moment from point to point and that gives rise to change in normal stress and equilibrium is established by the development of the shear at that particular point so this is another type of shear stress that we get one is the direct shear stress which is uniform throughout other is a non uniform shear which is developed due to change in bending moment and the third shear that we get is due to torsion so when you uh, carry out uh, a torsional action on a given bar then we see that the sections keep on rotating so at the free end where you have applied the torsional moment maximum rotation occurs while at the fixed end no rotation occurs while from this point to this point the rotation will keep on changing so one section rotates by theta the other rotates slightly less the third one rotates still less and so on and so forth as you go to the support there is no rotation so we say that continuously there is differential rotation the result of that is there is a shearing action between the different sections so we are having these sections which are continuously under torsion and they develop unequally under the influence of the support condition the result of that is now we say that there is uh, rotation uh, rotational difference between successive cross section that gives rise to a shear stress continuous shear stress where the maximum rotation if the rotation is about the neutral axis the maximum effect will be felt at the farthest point and at the center about which the rotation occurs there is no uh, shearing action at all so we see that the maximum rotation uh, shear is felt at the periphery and minimum is felt at the neutral axis while in case of uh, simple beam that we have considered Uh, there the uh, shear stress distribution for a rectangular section if you remember it that it is having a variation like this where it has got a maximum value at the neutral axis and zero value at the extreme end while in case of torsion it is the other way around at the top and bottom or at the free end at the outer periphery the shear is maximum at the axis of rotation about which the uh, whole bar, bar is twisting the shearing action is minimum that is no shear at that point and so on. so our <coughs> uh, different kinds of shearing stresses that we consider we have got a shear force that is to be converted to shear stress if it is direct shear we have got one formula if it is shear due to change of bending moment there is another formula if it is shear due to torsion then there is another shear formula that you have considered that is you have a torsional formula which we will see later on q upon r is equal to t upon z is equal to g theta upon l now that is a kind of formula that you have developed in your uh, college days where you have considered the shearing stress at any point from the axis of rotation r developed due to a torsional moment t and z is the polar moment of inertia that is for that given section about that axis about which rotation is occurring g is the shear modulus of the material that you are considering theta is the rotation of a section or relative rotation of a section between two points separated by l so if you consider the starting point and the ending point and if that distance is l then it is g theta upon l but if you take two points which are separated by let us say x then it is theta at this point theta at the next point so that is differential theta separated by that much distance so that is your gradient that you are considering g theta by l and so on now that is as far as your normal shear stress determination is concerned so if you want to convert shear force into shear stress then you have got three different formula you have to use appropriate formula for a given situation if it is torsion due to shear torsion due to change of bending moment or direct shear that you are considering 
now the next problem before us is uh, different theories that we are considering for converting the forces into stresses so out of that one of the theory that we are considering is the bending theory which enables us to convert the bending moment into bending stress because you have got a section carrying some bending moment i want to check whether the section can carry that moment or not for that purpose i need to convert it into stress and this theory enables us to uh, determine the stress in a uh, given section due to the bending moment also so we have what's our normal theory of bending where we make the usual assumptions for deriving the expressions of the theory the most important assumption that we uh, make is that the plane section before bending remain plane after bending so if you have got a section like this under the influence of moments which are developed at two ends then this section rotates like this it becomes like this the other one will rotate like this so we presume that the section which was plane earlier vertical it has simply rotated like this but all points in that plane now remain in the inclined plane that's all so the section which was plane now also is plane except that it has rotated so that is what we say that plane section before bending remains plane after bending so that is one important assumption which enables us to determine the stress and this happens when beam is under pure bending if you have got a beam for example for example a beam like this and it is subjected to only moments at two ends then we say that we have got a beam which has got a uniform moment throughout there is no shear force at all no change of bending moment because shear force arises due to change of bending moment so there is no change of bending moment if the beam is under such condition that is it is subject to pure bending then it uh, plane section before bending remain plane after bending that is almost met while in other cases it is slight deviation but still for most of the engineering application we will uh, ignore it then we say that the material of the beam is isotropic homogeneous and linearly elastic so that will enable us to use hooke's law and uh, determine the stress from strain and so on and some of the fibers as we see now the extreme fiber will undergo lot of compression a fiber below that less compression and so on so there should be some uh, friction between the two fibers which are trying to uh, elongate or get compressed differently because they are still connected but we say that okay for all uh, purposes of calculation i will presume that this fiber is free to elongate or compress independent of a fiber adjacent to it otherwise i will have to consider the interaction and then the complexity is increase for that purpose i will make an assumption that okay each fiber is free to elongate or get compressed and uh, beam bends in the form of an arc of a circle that is almost true when you have got uh, pure bending for the beam and so on for this purpose when you derive various uh, geometrical relationships and so on you get this simple bending formula that is sigma upon y is equal to m upon i is equal to e upon r so you have got this simple section which is undergoing you can say deformation so we presume that there is a strain diagram where there is maximum strain at this end or maximum strain at the other end and then once we say material is elastic then we say that the similar diagram will be present for stress so i have got strain diagram i have got the stress diagram and this is my section of length dx and there is some cross section to that and so on so i have got stress at any point so at stress at a distance y from neutral axis so i will say sigma upon y is equal to the moment that is applied at that section that is m and i is now the moment of inertia of the cross section e the young's modulus of the material and r is the radius of curvature into which the beam has bent so you have got a beam which has uh, under the influence of lateral load it is bent in the form of an arc of a circle and the radius of that circle now we say is r so we have got this relationship which relates the bending moment to the bending stress which is developed which may be either tension or compression 
and depending upon the distance of the element from the given uh, neutral axis that is m upon i into y. So we say that if y is 0 then it had neutral axis there is no stress at all. If y is maximum at top or bottom then you will be getting maximum stress and so on and so on. So this is our uh, bending formula in strength of material. Okay. Now similar thing we uh, use later on for converting the torsional moment into torsional stress. So we say that the torsional shear if you want to calculate related to torsional moment like theory of bending you have got theory of torsion and there are similar assumptions that each section is free to rotate independent of the other and beam is under pure torsion and lastly material of course isotropic homogeneous and linearly elastic. Isotropic means in all directions at a given point properties are same. Homogeneous means everywhere for the full beam it is the same properties and linearly elastic that for double the load the deformation is double, the internal force is developed also double, the reaction is double everything. So it is linearly elastic behavior and so on and so forth. For torsion then we again on the same lines derive from geometry uh, of deformations the relationship that Q upon R is equal to T upon Z equal to G theta by L where you consider that you have got a section like a shaft of a uh, you can say of a vehicle or uh, uh, which is undergoing some rotation uh, over there then for this shaft or for the circular section at any distance R from the center of rotation so this is R the stress at any point Q is equal to T upon Z into R. So at R equal to 0 that is at axis of rotation the stress is 0 at the extreme end you have got maximum value of R the stress is maximum so we say that the variation of shear stress is like this and of course at the other end also on the same line so you have got this variation of course it is the sign is same everywhere it is the same sign because the distance is same for all points on the periphery so you are getting Q the shear stress at any point as equal to T the torsional moment that you apply on the section upon Z the polar moment of inertia about this uh, point axis that is about Z axis perpendicular to the plane and R is the distance from axis of rotation. So we say that depending upon the sectional properties you can determine the shear stress at any point Q as equal to T upon Z multiplied by R. So we can say that the shear stress is due to three causes which we have seen. One is due to direct shearing action other is due to the uh, bending change in bending moment and the third one is due to torsion. So depending upon the kind of uh, force that you are considering you will have to use appropriate expression to convert the force which is either direct shear force P upon A or a shear force upon A for bending moment change of bending moment it is SAY bar upon IG that you consider for change in bending moment and the third one is due to the torsion so for that you have to use appropriate expression and so on. and then we say that the type of failure that we have listed earlier that you don't want the column or the axial force member to buckle under the influence of uh, compressive load so if you consider a member carrying axial force then we say that depending upon the end conditions it can buckle if it is supported at both ends simple supports it will buckle like this if it is fixed at both ends against rotation it will buckle without any rotation at this point if it is fixed at one end and uh, hinge at the other end then it will buckle like this and if it is free at one end and fixed at the other end then it will buckle with a side sway deformation and the critical load for buckling is uh, given by this Euler's formula for buckling which is pi square EI upon L square where we say that uh, for any column or any of these conditions we have got the material property of course E then we have got the cross sectional property which is I and this L is actually it is L effective it is effective length of the given column so I have got this L E now LE for columns which are having this kind of condition 
is L itself. For this type of condition, it is L by 2. For this type of column, it is L by root 2, I think, approximately, and here it is 2L. So, depending upon the kind of freedom, because if your effective length is larger, for example, for this column which is free at the other end and fixed at the base, <coughs> the effective length is large, 2L. In that case, your buckling load will be less, pi square EI upon 4L square. While if it is fixed at both ends, it is pi square EI upon L by 2 square. So, it will be 4 times pi square EI by L square. So, lesser the length, larger will be the uh, buckling load and so on. So, we many times ensure that your column is not excessively long. If it is long, then provide some lateral restraint or additional members so that it does not buckle and so on and so forth. So, our idea is either to increase uh, buckling load, you either increase I, that is provide larger section or reduce the value of L. If you reduce the value of L, then we say that the buckling load increases and so on because that L is in the denominator. Likewise, we will say that we have got various uh, theories associated with the stress distribution. This I think I had just indicated to you that your shear stress distribution for change of bending moment is of this type. There you are considering the shear stress at any point. This shaded or the pink area that you see is actually A. Y bar is the distance actually this Y and Y bar is the distance up to its center that is from neutral axis up to the center of that section itself. So, I have got this distance as Y bar that is all. While I is the moment of inertia of the whole section and B is the width of the section and so on. So, this way you will be able to determine the shear stress distribution over here. So, in short we say that we have got simple formulae for uh, various types of operations. One is to convert the bending moment to bending stress. So, you have got bending formula. The shear stress determined based on the change in bending moment in the section and the shear force associated with it. The third one is due to torsion and for buckling load, you can use this simple Euler formula pi square EI upon pi square. So, I think we are almost coming to the uh, end of our presentation for today. Uh, simple equations, I will just, I mean, you are all well versed with those equations. You have got simple equations for, uh, governing equations for uh, structural engineering applications. One is the moment curvature relationship, which you have seen from theory of bending, that you have got the theory of bending which relates M upon I is equal to E upon R. While if you take 1 upon R on one side, then it is M upon EI. And if you take M on one side, then we will be getting M as equal to EI into 1 upon R. Now, for 1 upon R, the approximate expression itself is d2y by dx square because curvature is approximately related to uh, d2y by dx square which is the rate of change of slope. So, slope is the rate of change of displacement while rate of change of the slope itself uh, approximately is the curvature. Uh, so, we consider this ei d2y by d, uh, dx square derived directly from area of bending with an approximate expression for curvature as equal to d2y by dx square. So, we can say that our governing equation for uh, structural engineering one equation is moment curvature relationship other is what you use for your buckling uh, problem where you are considering the column which is subjected to axial load at both ends so you have got axial force applied in this way where it is hinge at one end and roller at the other end and then we presume that it buckles in this fashion sideways so at any point now we consider the bending moment as equal to this is the axial load that you are considering the lateral displacement at that point is y so we say that the moment at that point is p into y so i am now having moment curvature relationship that is ei d2y by dx square is equal to mx which is in this case p into y 
with a minus sign because of the, uh, uh, the bending formula that we have derived and taking terms on one side now we get this uh, governing equation for buckling problem which relates the axial force and the force that you are applying to the curvature developed by it and so on and so forth and then you have got if it is a slab then i think most of you have not exposed to this kind of uh, equation unless you studied theory of plates in the postgraduates or other level you are getting similar to your ei d2 i mi dx square which you have considered for one dimensional problem uh, for the beam as such here for two dimensional problem of a slab you get curvature in x direction curvature in y direction and the twist so all of that put together gives you another governing equation for the behavior of a slab i think uh, we will not go into the details of that so with this we come to the conclusion of uh, today's presentation and we will say that as far as our objective for today's lecture was concerned our objective was to determine the forces in the members to the stresses because our next stage that we shall be considering is design for design i need to know the stresses so my analysis is going to give me all the internal forces i need to convert that into stress and my criteria for designing any member is that the actual stress must be less than the permissible stress so my criteria is very simple only thing is i need to see what is the actual stress whether it is due to bending moment or due to axial force due to shear so due to all these causes respective types of stresses will be created and those are to be checked with the corresponding permissible stresses so a st shear stress developed will be compared with permissible shear stress the normal stress with the permissible normal stress be it tension or compression okay i think with this we come to the conclusion and if there is any question you can ask otherwise uh, next week we will meet again okay. <coughs> i think it might be little uh, uh, maybe boring to you because uh, you are you are brought back to college days for us again going to uh, sit in the college classroom but i had not uh, gone to the details of derivation because you don't require it now you are at a stage where you need direct formula and because you are using software uh, you are uh, going even one step further then you will not calculate it only the software will calculate the stresses and you will directly be able to uh, arrive at a conclusion whether the member or the material that you are considering or the section that you have used whether it is uh, adequate for resisting the given section uh, given internal forces and so on okay thank you uh, we will meet again in the next week I think most of them are uh, used to using e tabs. E tabs. Right? Uh, yeah. So uh, later on we will mm. get involved with some e tabs operations and see how these steps are actually. Uh, mm. That is what you are doing in your normal day to day. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay.